everybody and welcome Tom Daly here from the Academy of Financial Trading. We are about to begin your eighth webinar in your foundation trading program. This evening's webinar is going to discuss how you can progress to become a counter retail trader. What does that mean? What's another way of saying it? It means how can you operate like those highly lucrative market makers who operates out there in the marketplace. This evening's webinar will obviously take a similar structure to all previous webinars where we will start out by having a look at our risk warning. It's crucial that we're all aware of the risks associated with trading, with leverage trading and with investing as well. Again, what we aim to do is we aim to help you to mitigate those risks in as far as is physically possible. At the end of this evening's lesson, we have a very, very exciting announcement. So do make sure to stay tuned. And we also had advised you all that we will be going for that, I guess, that award for your attendance, um, where we were going to be giving away membership to Shaw Academy, lifetime membership to Shaw Academy. So we'll be making that selection at the end of this evening's webinar. So do make sure to stay tuned for that. Let's have a very quick recap as to where we've come from so far. We've looked at various different headings, including Japanese candlesticks. We spoke about how those colorful little devices can show you exactly what is happening in the financial markets. We spoke about support and resistance. We said that they're like floors and ceilings in the market. They're like throwing a tennis ball against a hard object. If the tennis ball was to bounce, we would say that it is strong. If the tennis ball breaks through, we would question the construction professional who built that floor or ceiling. We say that that tennis ball must have super tennis ball strength. We call those sorts of movements breakouts. We say that they will result in trends. We speak about channels where you've got diagonal pressure building in the marketplace. We speak about triangles and ATRs and then we looked at Fibonacci retracements, which I would say rather sarcastically is everybody's favorite. Fibonacci retracements, they're an interesting indicator. We like them because it tells us where our opponent is likely to make mistakes. That's why it is useful. So this evening, what we're going to be looking at is the heading of moving averages, okay? In the context of becoming a counter retail trader. As always, we will be looking at them to try to identify where our opponents are making mistakes and how we can then take advantage of those mistakes. And the question which I've got for everybody this evening, the first question this evening, is whether or not you have used moving averages previously. If you have, type in MA, Mother Alpha. If you've come across them, if you've used them previously, I can see that Monica has, and Mabel and Brian, and Denise and Jay. No, Jason, you haven't, excuse me. There are too many names to read out. Otherwise, my voice is going to go prematurely. So a lot of people have. But then I can see the likes of Rachel and Leah Dane and Gary and Minesh. You have not. What we're going to do is we're going to assume that you have never looked at this heading before. Because then we're going to define what it is. And we're going to hopefully really make sure that you know what is going on. So guys... On the screen in front of us in just one moment, right about now, we've got a Euro-Dollar chart. A Euro-Dollar daily chart. And we can see on this chart what is happening. We can see that the market, I guess, has been falling more often than not, hasn't it? It's falling from left to right where the euro dollar declined from that 115 level down to that 108, 109 level. And we can see that. Okay, we've got the euro depreciating and falling dramatically. You can see that by looking at the chart. On the screen, we also have a red line running through the candlesticks. And what that red line represents is an average of the price information going across the screen. Okay? Now, if we can all agree that the candlesticks are showing us a market which has been falling, wouldn't it be fair to say that the moving average, it tells us nothing that we don't already know? 
we can already see what the market is doing. It's not exactly reinventing the wheel. It's just showing us what has happened. Could we all agree with that? It's not exactly breaking every norm or every logic which we have ever encountered. It's not, it's not magical. It doesn't have a superpower as some educators might have you believe. It's simply an average of the price. What we've got on the screen now is a gold chart with that same type of moving average. And you can see again that the price has been falling over the past three to four months, there or thereabouts. And we also can see other interesting anomalies. We can see when the market breaks through the moving average and trades from above to below that it shows bearish pressure. When the market breaks from below to above, it shows bullish pressure. Does everybody see that? So the breaches through these areas are showing us areas of pressure. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we assume, I guess, that we're all intelligent people, intelligent individuals on this webinar, and looking at this screen, would that be enough for you to go out and to risk your hard-earned cash? Would that be enough information? Let's say you saw a candlestick breaking through a red line. You work hard for the money you earn, and rightly so. Would it be right to risk it for that? Absolutely not. These are just an indicator. But some people believe that they have huge strength, which they just don't. So what are we going to do? We're going to use these indicators to show us where people are likely to fail. Because where retail fail, that will result in opportunities for us. Does that make sense to everyone? Let's see it again. We're going to use these indicators to show us where people who are, are likely to put failed orders because larger entities will target against those individuals and then we can work with that larger participant. That's our idea. Call it bait, call it an indicator of failure, call it an area where you're likely to see high volatility, high volume. And that's maybe one of the missing pieces which most people never consider in trading. Who are you working with and who are you working against? So let's define what exactly these moving averages are. They show an average price of an instrument over a set period of time. Okay, and that's important. Because if I said to you, or if I asked you the question what your average working hours were, if I asked you that simple question, what are your average working hours, it's quite a vague question. And the reason why it's vague is, I guess, let me give you an example from myself. This week has been a bit of a longer week than normal. My average working hours might have been 12 or 14 hours per day. So if we looked at that, you would add the total number of days this week. You would add the total number of hours. You would divide the hours by the days and you would get the average. And if you then ask what the average working hours were over the past five years... That could be dramatically different because you mightn't have had such hectic projects on. So does everybody see that the larger the number you divide by, the further it's likely to be from recent activity? And the smaller the number you divide by, the closer it will be to recent activity. And that's a hugely important point because these indicators, they give us an indication of the current movement with a lag, with a delay. And what will happen is that other people, other commentators, maybe brokers, they will come out and they will tell you that that is a problem, that they are based on historical information. Has anybody heard that before? You can't use technical analysis because it's based on historical information. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what options do we have? Let's think about this. Unless you've got a DeLorean that can travel at 88 miles per hour, everything in the world in which we live is historical. There is no question about that. We don't travel through telephone boxes into the future. We don't have that DeLorean that can actually move with a flux capacitor. So what we're trying to say is we accept the realities and we say that people, not history, People repeat themselves. People operate in similar ways. And we accept 
the strengths and weaknesses of the information which we have available to us. That's why this is important. Okay, let's talk about this a little further. These indicators, they can show us either strength or weakness, or they can show us potential bounce areas. We like working with the market for a simple reason. Because it's the easiest option and it's the clearest indication of what is happening. We use it to measure direction. So let's have a look at how these moving averages are calculated. If we had a simple moving average, and let's imagine we have daily closing prices of 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, then 5, then 6, and then 7. The first day of a five-period simple moving average would add together the information from the first five days, divided by the number of days, and end up with the number 3. It's a reasonably straightforward calculation. The calculation in itself can only occur after the fifth day has completed. Does that make sense, guys? You can only perform the analysis once you've got a complete set of data. Now, the interesting point about this is on that second day of the five-day simple moving average, something interesting occurs. You get new information and you cross out the old information. Does everybody see that? You add one in and you remove one. And we can see what the danger is. What if the newest data is incredibly large? And what if the oldest data was incredibly small? That could skew the results, as could the opposite. If the newest data was very small and if the oldest data was very large. So straight away, we've identified a weakness with this indicator. And we would be operating, we as a company would be operating some way, well, somewhat immorally if we didn't point this out. But we have solutions. Let's look at the third day. On the third day, you add in another new piece of information. You take out another old piece of information. So what we've got to do is find a way of combating that emphasis which is placed on the oldest information. We'll do that through the use of an exponential moving average. Let's speak about this further. Because a question which tends to come in more often than not is what period, what number should we use? And the straightforward answer, if there is one, is that the shorter the number of periods, the closer it's going to be to the recent activity. For example, a 10 period simple moving average will be very, very close to what's happening to the market right now. A longer period moving average, like a 50 or a 200, that might be used for longer periods of time. So the 10 is much, much closer to the current action than the 50. Okay, so what we're going to show you now, we've got a question for you right now. We want to encourage you all to really participate and to ask as many questions as possible so that you really know what is going on. So on the screen in front of you now, you've got our old friend, the Euro-Swiss franc chart. And we're going to play that, that old-fashioned game you see in newspapers years ago where you want to X marks the spot. Okay, so we're going to show you where a 10-period simple moving average is and we're going to show you where a 200-period simple moving average is. But before we do, we want you to put an X, if you like, or tell me, maybe more importantly, you can't really put an X on the chart, only I could do it, we want you to tell me where the X should go, okay? So we'll look at that 10 period moving average first, okay? We'll look at that 10 period moving average first. Do you think it's going to be roughly around the price that we have on the screen at the moment, 1.0881? 1.081. Do you think it's going to be roughly around there? Or do you think it's going to be up towards that 112 level? Or do you think it's going to be down towards that 102 level? Type in the price that you think it's going to be and I'll see if I can come up with some way of maybe putting in an average selection somewhere on the screen with a couple of 102s, a couple of 117s, a couple of 108s, a lot of 108s, 109s, 102s, 105s, 108s, a lot of 108s, a lot of 107s. Now, one thing I will draw your attention to, it shouldn't make a difference in what information you're typing in, is that this is a weekly chart. 
okay? It doesn't really matter because this 10 period simple moving average is going to be a 10 week simply moving average simply because this chart is set on a weekly time frame. So that's why you'll hear me use that word period more often than not. You'll hear me call it a 10 period simply moving average because the period is defined by the setting you have on the chart. If you've got your chart set to an hourly candlestick chart, the 10 period simple moving average will be the average of the past 10 hours. On a weekly candlestick chart, which we're looking at here, the period moving average will equal the past 10 weeks. On a daily candlestick chart, the average will be the past 10 days. Okay, so what have we got? A lot of people are typing in the 104s, 110s, 117s. Okay, one seven, a couple of 117s coming in. Okay, let's have a look and see exactly where we are. So we have the 10 week sample period or excuse me, the 10 period sample moving average coming in just under the current market price. Just coming in a shade above that 108 level. Okay, it's tight and close to the activity which is occurring right here, right now. So we want to explain now this lag, this delay, and we want to show you exactly what we mean by it. 10 period simple moving average as we've repeated time and time again at this stage is close to the current market action. Do you think that the 200 period simple moving average is going to be close or far away? Okay, and if we think of it like this, I think this chart highlights it quite succinctly because it is a weekly chart. So if we think of 200 weeks, it's four years. So think of it like that. So we're looking at the average price of the Euro Swiss franc over the past four years. And if we then think back to lesson number two and lesson number four, where we spoke about, spoke about that 120 peg, which was in existence for such a long time. And it's only since about this time last year, almost exactly this time last year, where that peg has been broken. So do you think the 200 will be much closer to that 120 level? Or do you think it'll be much closer to the current market action? What do we think? Okay, let's have a check and see. A couple of 102s coming in. I'm going to take that that's a 120 written incorrectly. I'll be kind and I'll say that. I'll say that's 120. A lot of people typing in that 120 level, 116, one um, downtrending, Michael, you're saying to 108. That's fine. Downtrending is fine towards 108. Elizabeth, you're saying around about 117. Okay, let's have a look. So, exactly where it is right up there just north of that it's almost touching that 118 level 1.17865 is the value that's on the chart at that particular horizontal line and we can see that that's where the 200 week simple moving average is so that's the delay that's the lag it's going to take a long time to that to get down to where the action is right here right now isn't it it's going to take a long long time which is where that lag comes into play where that delay comes into play that is not giving enough emphasis if you like to the current market activity so that's it in the, if you like an exaggerated fashion we're lucky that we have an exaggerated example that we're able to show you let's have a look at another example we're back to a daily candlestick chart we're looking at the oil market from the end of last year we've got two moving averages on the screen one is a 10 period simple moving average here there is a 50 period simple moving average which is which? What do we think? Which is which? The red line is one, the blue line is another. A lot of people typing in that the red is the 10, the blue is the 50. And thankfully, we're all absolutely correct. We can see that it is much, much closer to current activity. We can see that that red line is much, much closer to current activity, can't we? It makes sense to us that that would be the shorter period moving average. It makes sense. That 50 period moving average, it's a little bit further away. It does react, but it doesn't react as quickly as the red one greater stuff so the smaller the period the tighter it is to the action so then we come on to the idea of this kind of tortoise versus the hare and we ask is fast better than slow like everything it's dependent upon your own objectives and people come to us and they want to learn how to trade and they want to learn how to how to make ridiculous profits in the market 
And since we founded the Academy of Financial Trading, I personally have listened to clients in every single webinar and every single email and every single call. And we try to manage people's expectations. Because when somebody comes to us and when they expect to make ridiculous profits over a very short period of time, we've got a duty to be totally honest and to say to them that it's not that easy, that it does take work. And if you're willing to put the work in, it can work out. But you've got to view it like any other profession. So what we say is how you operate is going to be dependent upon your objectives. What level of risk are you willing to take? How much return are you looking to make? What time have you got available to trade? What markets are available at the time which you have set aside? Because if you're coming from Europe, you're going to have difficulty accessing European equities because you're probably busy during the working day. If you're coming from Australasia, you're probably going to have difficulty accessing other markets due to the time difference. You've got to have a portfolio which is balanced. And I know that during that next lesson, lesson number nine, that risk management lesson, we're going to be covering that much, much more. So I've got another question for you guys this evening. Okay, and really, let's try to have a little bit of fun here. What do you think are the most popular moving averages which we can use? What do you think the most popular moving averages which we can use are? What do you think? There's a wide variety. There's some very popular ones. You've got the 10, you've got the 50, you've got the 200, you've got then other ones like a, uh, a 25, you've got a 75, you've got a 100, you've got a 500. It all depends, Scott, you can say absolutely it does depend on the objective sometimes, but there still are particular values or particular particular moving averages, I guess, which are simply always going to be more popular ones for reasons which will now go through. Okay, so that's what we want to have a look at. Okay, when we ask the question, what are the most popular moving averages, the 200 period moving average is probably the most popular. And when you listen to any of the popular news channels and when any market is approaching a 200 period moving average, it's as if somebody got a spray can and they literally spray paint the number 200 onto the auto queue. Because, you know, you can know when somebody's reading from a script. We don't have scripts here because, but you'll know when somebody is reading from a prompter because it's a little bit too perfect what they're saying. So they put that number 200 up and then every retail trader out there thinks that this 200 period moving average is built out of some metal that the US government has developed and it's absolutely unbreakable. Now we don't think that. We think that the market can break through an area. We look for opportunities where people get it wrong because that's how we make a profit. Then we have the 100 period simple moving average in second place. It's the second most popular moving average. And then in third place, we've got a joint second runner up. We've got the 50 and we've got the 10 period simple moving average. So SMA, that stands for simple moving average because it's simply calculated by adding and dividing. So on the screen in front of you now, we've got a 10 period moving average, we've got a 50 period moving average, and we've got a 200 period moving average. Can everybody see the distance which exists between the 200 period moving average and the market and indeed everything else which we can see on the screen? It's quite a distance away, isn't it? But let's stick with the plan here. When the market breaches through these areas, that's where it gets interesting. That's when it gets interesting for us. Could we agree that a breakout might be one piece of confirmation and maybe a break of a second moving average line might be a second piece of confirmation? What do we think about that? Okay, maybe it's going to provide us with multiple pieces of confirmation. And let's ask a bit of a question now. And I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent. So when I do, make sure I come back to the plan, okay? Let's imagine you were looking at this market. And let's imagine you had decided that you were only going to risk, we'll say 1% of your account in total. And during our next lesson, we're going to be covering this risk management element and we're going to find out what exactly this means. But for now, let's pretend that we're all willing to risk 1% of our total capital. If you're going to risk 1%, 
Why would you risk it all in one go? Let's think about that. Why would you risk it all in one go? Why wouldn't you risk a little bit early on, maybe 0.25% early on, and then when you're proved more correct, maybe you look to risk the rest. And if you operate it in that way, basically by the time it gets to the second point, you'll have generated profit from the first. Does that make sense? By the time you get to the second point, you will have generated profit from the previous position. And you can protect that profit. So we like listening to the market. If we're making money, it's a little bit like getting a promotion in work, isn't it? If you get a promotion in work, it generally means that what you're doing is good. We won't make any, any guesses as to how you got that promotion, but it generally means that you're doing well. And that's the type of piecemeal trading that we like to do. And we're going to be coming back to this a little bit further as time goes on. Now that we're a little bit comfortable about with what these indicators conceptually are, why do we now have a look at how people use them? And let's put that into a bit of context, okay? Because we don't just look at a chart and we don't just believe in this magical power of technical analysis. Instead, we believe that inexperienced traders fundamentally get it wrong. And we believe that the same is true in just about any profession. If you're not a doctor and you try to be a doctor, you're likely to get it wrong. Okay, it's just a, a basic premise. If you're not a carpenter and you try to be a carpenter, you're probably going to get it wrong. So what we are looking for is where people are going to get it wrong. Because where they get it wrong, we will get it right. Does that make sense, guys? It's a basic premise. You're looking for the weaknesses of your opponent to find where you have opportunities. It's the same as in any business. You can look at any business sector and you can tell yourself or you can understand that it is weak, that it might be soft, or they mightn't be doing it right. And you might think that you've got a better way of doing it. You might think you've got a bigger way of doing it, a cheaper way of doing it. So. That's the idea. It's just like any other business area, really. So what we have is the first way of doing things is, is being a momentum trader. Okay? And let me think here. What's the best way of describing this? A momentum trader, he's somebody who, if they were sitting at a train station, and if they saw a train coming towards them, they would say that they feel that that train is likely to continue in its given direction. The reason why they would say that is because it's moving damn fast and it's an incredibly heavy object. Okay? So that's what a momentum trader says. It's more likely to continue than to stop on the button and head back the way it came. Now we like that idea. We like accepting the strength which can be seen in a market because if you do otherwise, it's a contrarian out outlook and it's even difficult from a psychological perspective. So let's talk about that, okay? Let's talk about this. We like working with the trend. Let's have a look at it on a chart and let's understand this as much as we can. We're looking at this Euro US dollar chart. And on this chart, the areas of interest is where the market breached from above to below okay from above the average to below the average or from below the average to above the average okay so anytime it intersects with that moving average we would consider to be an area of interest and it could be seen as a piece of confirmation right at this most recent signal you could say that it is a piece of confirmation to go short now you might need some further supporting evidence. And let's have a look and see if we can spot any further evidence. Can we all see that the market was operating in a small range right at the top? Would you have noticed that? Well, certainly if you put enough time into it, you will. So what we then have is two pieces of confirmation. We have the break from above to below and we have the breach of support. So we have shorts, we also have bearish engulfing pattern, that large candlestick. So that's giving us maybe a third piece of confirmation. There are a couple of dojis signifying a potential top in the market. Maybe that's a fourth piece of confirmation. And we have the market has not broken back above 
above that moving average line until right down here. You can see there was even a question mark there. But even most recently, which was the end of last year, to be fair, so we know since then it has recovered. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to build up the weapons or the tools which we can use to operate in the financial markets. Okay? So the momentum trader, they want to work with the market. And we like the idea of that. You can look at this crude oil chart and we can see the exact same thing. Where the market breaches through these levels, you might view it as an area of opportunity. And you could be coming in and out quite frequently. But is there any harm in that if you're coming in and out once every couple of days, once every seven days, every 10 days, whatever the case may be, we're totally fine with that. So we're working with the market and we're accepting its strength and we're zigzagging in and out and in and out because we're happy to do so as long as we're finding opportunities. And that's the type of way that we're looking to operate. Okay, that's the type of way that you might be looking to operate. You're working with momentum. Now, all that being said, what I've just gone through there can be seen to be fundamentally misleading. Okay? Because I've made it look like that would be a simple thing to do. I've made it look like that would be very, very easy. And if we just moved on from this point right now, it wouldn't be right. Okay? There are some factors to consider here. I want you to imagine this situation, guys. Let's imagine that you got short on that break from above to below. And let's imagine the market is right on here now at that $41 level. And let's imagine you're up $1,000. Okay, as the market has moved down to that $41 price, you've at $1,000 profit. So let's all focus on this. Guys, you've got nothing protected there. If the market reversed, it could go right back up to your entry point or beyond. Because you mightn't have moved your stop loss down. Your stop loss is still right up at or above your entry point. You had $1,000 profit, but the market could reverse and take a lot of it back. That would be psychologically, a, it's a very hard thing to understand and to accept. And some of the important things which we need to understand are entries, absolutely. But with respect, the exit side of the trade is far more important. If you don't know how to exit, you can never realize a gain. So we like this from a fundamental perspective, but we do have a major problem with it, and that is the exit side of things. And we will be coming back to this exit side of things again during that lesson number nine. Now we want to have a look at how the reversal traders operate. The reversal traders, they are the type of people who, who I suppose they believe that there is nothing bigger out there. Okay, and I'm sitting back in my chair to try and explain this because I'm in a room at the moment which thankfully has a floor and a ceiling. If it didn't, I'd be able to levitate and this would be a whole different type of webinar. So let's imagine a reversal trader. They sit in a room in their armchair and they are delighted that the market is bouncing up and down between a ceiling, a resistance point and a floor which is a supportive point. And these traders, they don't want to see the big world outside. They don't want to see that kind of opportunity. They like the supposed certainty of a small gain. Now, the issue with a small gain is this. Okay, let's draw it out and let's try to understand what we're talking about here. The reversal trader, they trade within this room. So they've got to wait for a market to go down to a supportive zone and bounce. So they've got to wait until this area of X in order to be sure that the market has indeed bounced. So they enter perhaps at that level of X. They enter a long position. The market goes up, it'll bounce, hopefully they imagine, off the, off the resistance point from the ceiling, and again it'll move back down. And they will have to wait for that bounce to occur and get out and possibly into a reversal trade at that level of Y. Okay? So they're missing out on a bit at the top and they're missing out on a bit at the bottom. So what they're doing is they're working at this level here within the range. And let's imagine they're making let's imagine they're making 10 pips every time they do this. Their transactional charges 
on this market, which might be something like euro dollar, their transactional charges, let's imagine it was three pips. So they've got to pay three pips before they go out and make 10 pips. And your broker will absolutely love you for that. Your broker will invite you to lots of events. They'll invite you to their office. They'll give you champagne because you're paying for their bonuses. Now, what we like to do instead is we like to look at the bigger picture. What if we could find a breakout which could generate 300 pips? Okay, we'll still pay the same level of transactional charges, that same three pips. Does everybody see that by trading a longer term movement, you're going to be reducing your barriers to your success and you're going to be trying to beat the house? Does everybody see that? Now, maybe we're just full of rubbish. OK, maybe we're just here. I don't know, because because we've got nothing better to do or because we're those type of people. Or maybe it's the case that everybody else who tells you something else is getting paid to say it. OK, there's only one person that you're making wealthy for trading within that room. And it certainly is not you. Certainly not you. So we don't like reversal trading. We don't like it because it's tough from a psychological perspective. You're going to make somebody else wealthy and we don't see it working for retail traders. It's just that simple. So what we see happening here is that this type of individual, what they do would make any sane person ill. Because here's what they do, okay? When the market is falling from above to below, they expect it to bounce. Do they win or lose at that level of, of X, guys? If they buy at that top level, expecting it to bounce off that moving average, do they win or lose? What do we think? Absolutely, they lose. And what's worse than the loss is what I'm about to show you. They miss a massive, massive trade. When it comes to trading, a loss is bad. But missing a massive opportunity is infinitely worse it's a huge sin and if i could explain it through more colorful language i would okay missing an opportunity it's it's wearing your life away things come along and if you don't seize the moment it's just your fault isn't it, it it's that's all it is it's your fault you had your opportunity let the next guy take the opportunity instead so what they do is they look at an opportunity and they'll say you know what i don't want you i want to make 10 pips profit we don't like that. It just does not stack up. Okay? It's the same no matter what scenario. They keep trying to trade the bounce, which never happens. Why do they do it? Because somebody told them it was a good idea. It's as simple as that. And when we talk about moving averages, they're nice. But what's better than that is to put multiple indicators together and to get greater confirmation. Dual moving averages. Multiple moving averages. OK, it'll give you supposedly greater confirmation. The positive side is that it does give you that stronger signal. The negative side is that it can leave significant profits behind. So what do we think of that? What do we think of that from a conceptual sense? What do we think, guys? OK, honestly, tell me what you think. It's going to give you more supporting evidence, but you're not going to make as much money. What do you honestly think of that? Do you think it's a good thing or do you think it's a terrible thing? What do you think? Is it good? Is it a disaster? Genuinely, let's be totally honest here. Do you think it's a good thing or do you think it's a terrible thing? Okay, what have we got? Eh, a mixed bag, I guess. Okay, let me see if I can help you out. If I've got a stronger signal that makes me money in a safer way, I'm happy. Because you can never have all of the profit. And trading, like, it's a little bit like life in a way, isn't it? Yes, you try to seize every opportunity. But sometimes things just don't go your way. And it's about how you bounce back and how you deal with it. That's the point. So you cannot have all of the profit all of the time. It's no different than saying that everything in the world must always go your way. It's just not realistic, okay? We need to have some pain, okay? So what we have is 
on the screen we can see two moving averages. We can see a 10 period simple moving average and we can see a 21 period simple moving average. And we can see at the top of the screen from maybe July, June into July of last year, we can see that when the red breaks through the blue, we can say to ourselves that that might give us stronger confirmation. I don't know why I circled that with my pen, because I have a circle already in place automatically. So there we go. So we have the break from above to below. It supposedly gives us stronger confirmation. And then when it breaks back from below to above, would give us another piece of confirmation. So can everybody see, when you use that dual cross, it might be seen to show us a lot more of the profit. It's the same example which we looked at a moment ago pretty much. It gives you it gives you more confirmation. It's as simple as that, isn't it? And again, to remain in a trade like that, you would actually need to have surgically implanted inside yourself steel metallic objects to be able to stomach that sort of a movement it would be incredibly difficult to actually do it. You need to have an exit strategy. But this gives you an indication as to an entry strategy. Let's talk a little bit further. Let's have a look at it in the type of markets like Facebook, the exact same type of occurrence. You have a short-term moving average trading through a longer-term moving average. It might give you a signal to enter in the short side. When it moves back up through it, it might give you a signal to exit that trade. Market then moves favorably in the other direction. Again, you get signals to enter, signals to exit, time and time again, showing you the momentum which potentially exists in each market. Okay, a lot of people like this type of trading. A lot of people like it for the simple reason, um, I guess it's for the same reason that we like it really, because it, it's objective, isn't it? It's not subjective. You're not reliant on your opinion. You enter based upon what the chart, what the price is actually doing. Okay, nothing more, nothing less. There isn't a great amount of thought which has to go into the process. On this gold chart, we can see the exact same thing. You get multiple signals of where to enter, where to exit, where to enter, where to exit. And you can see when a market does indeed move in your favor, when it does trend strongly in a given direction, it can be seen to be quite lucrative. So that's why a lot of retail traders would tend to use it. But it may not be all of the information which is required. We might need more confirmation. And how we might do that is by putting more moving averages on the screen in order to confirm the sustained movement which might exist. We would look at something which we refer to as the COMA, the correct order of moving averages. And what this means is putting a lot of other indicators on the same chart. Okay, a lot of other moving averages. So on the screen in front of you now, you've got what I would describe as a visual nightmare. If I had nightmares about trading, which thankfully I don't, but if I did have nightmares, it would be about charts which look like this. It would be about people trying to make a simple situation look complex, and that drives us crazy. People try to make things look complex so they can sell some, some terrible product. The real beauty is to try to make something look simple. What we have here, which is nice, is we've got lots of different moving averages and they're close and they're tied to the price. Okay? What we have is where you've got multiple breaches, you've got more confirmation. That's the moral of the story with this chart. Is everybody comfortable? I don't want to traumatize anyone, but where you have multiple breaches, you've got more confirmation. That's all that this chart tells us. It doesn't tell us anything else. It doesn't tell us that the price is going to fall by 10% in the next five minutes. It doesn't tell us anything else. It just gives us a little bit more confirmation. That's all it's doing. So you've got all of those indicators and you can see the areas of interest. The correct order is good because it gives you more confirmation. It's bad because you leave a lot of profit on the table. Now, we've been pointing out different things which we can do throughout tonight's webinar, but what you must remain conscious of is whether to use either a simple or an exponential moving average. The simple, as we know, that just adds everything together and it averages it out. It's good because it's accurate. It's bad because it can be slow. An EMA, an exponential moving average, 
that places greater emphasis on the newest data. It gives, it combats that issue which we looked at during that Euro Swiss franc example. Okay? It doesn't place a greater amount of emphasis on the oldest data. Do we all see that? So we've got a situation where we've got some old data, where we've got some new data, and how we combine it all together is by using our heads and by blending it all together in a mixture, a little bit like, like that mixtape for anybody who would have ever made such a thing. So what we do is we try to blend it all together in an intelligent fashion, okay? We try to blend the SMAs with the EMAs and we have a dual cross mixture of everything, okay? We're going to try to put it all together to try to catch a move quicker and then add to it when it's working out in our favor. That's called scaling in. When you do something right, you do more of it, you replicate. So what we're going to look at is a 10 EMA, a 15 SMA and a 30 SMA. We're going to combine them together to see how we can scale into a market. Okay? We're going to tr use them together to see how and where and why we can scale in. How we can improve on our entries. Okay? So on the screen in front of us now, we've got sterling dollar. Okay? And what we've got are crossovers. We're going to be looking at this chart from left to right, from the oldest data way back in September of last year right through to present day. So we've got a crossover. That could be signal number one, where the red breaches, excuse me, where the bread, the, the bread, no, where the red breaches through the blue could be signal number one. Okay? And where the red breaches through the green could be signal number two. So we have multiple signals. What you could do is you could take a small trade in that first signal and increase the size of your trade at the second signal. And then we have our exit. When the market breaches back through all the way down there in early October, you might exit trade number one. And where we've got that second breach, you might exit trade number two. So you would generate profits from both trades. And as we continue on, we can see that red breaching through the green. You can see the green breaching through the blue, giving more signals. So you are scaling in and scaling out. You're jumping in and jumping out. And not only could you get in and get out, but every time you're getting out of one trade, you're not just getting out, but you might take an opposite position. Okay? So if you had entered on the long side and if there was a crossover from above to below telling you to get out, you might not just get out, you might get out and take the opposite position. That's what a lot of retail traders would tend to do. Okay? So as we can see, the market moves sideways for a period of time. We have the same type of objective signals, but then even you can see the most recent signal is the type of move that most people would tend to look for because when a market tends to trend in a given direction quite strongly, you can see the results of it. So you can see currently, anybody who was using this type of method would have been in from that 151, 152, 150, 151 area, we know that, that this, this chart, this British pound US dollar chart, right now it's trading right down to that 142 level. So there would have been a sizable movement in favor of those who would have shorted based on the information which the moving average has been giving them. And you can see this type of example time and time again. Again, most um, from back in September in this silver chart, you can see that same type of action where there is a crossover from below to above of the moving averages. It might be a signal to go long. When the market crosses back from above to below, it might be a signal to either exit the long trade and then re enter a short trade. So you again have these multiple entries. You have areas where the market is moving sideways. You're never concerned about those areas really because when the market does trend in a strong movement, which we saw from November into December, you can see the results that it gives you. It's well worth your while to use this type of example, if you wish. Okay? 
So we look at this type of trading. We look at it because retail traders use it. Do we use it? No, we don't. We don't trade using moving averages. We feel that you need a more precise plan. We feel that you need to know what you are doing in every single situation. We believe you should not be reliant upon moving averages. We feel that because retail traders are, and we all know that retail traders tend to fail. You need to use something which gives you more peace of mind because that's how you gauge success. That's what we like to talk about. What we've been gearing up towards is whether or not these indicators work. And let's be totally honest. It is the money which moves markets. And it's just that simple. I don't move a market, the Academy of Financial Trading doesn't move a market, you don't move a market, the real money moves the markets. And retail traders, they do not possess the majority of the capital. Even we, we would trade what we would consider to be fairly modest figures. We cannot move a market. But those who have the largest amount of capital actually can. And the funny thing is that retail traders, they trade incredibly predictably. So let's think about this, guys. Most traders are actually trading with their opponents. Does that make sense to everyone? Most traders are actually telling their opponent where they are going to trade. Okay? It's a little bit like going into a bookie's and the bookie having the power to chop the legs off the horse that you are looking at. It's that type of craziness. So individual traders are telling their opponents where they are going to trade. And what then happens is a market maker, they have power to move markets. Now, market makers are financially driven companies and they're in an incredibly competitive space. So what you find is if retail trades so predictably, why not try to trade against them? That's the style of trading which we like. Why do we like it? Let's be totally honest. We like it because it's incredibly profitable. How do we know it's incredibly profitable? It's incredibly profitable for us. But it's also incredibly profitable because we look at the balance sheets of any market maker which is listed on any exchange globally. It's not a statement of opinion. It's a matter of fact. So that's who you should want to trade like. Not some, not anything else. You want to trade like the most profitable entity. So what we want to do is we want to teach people how to trade in that way. Can everybody see on the screen in front of them that retail traders would have been buying at that left hand side at every single area of support. They would have been buying in those areas. They would have more than likely have been buying at those green arrows. Why? Because it's predictable. Because that's the way they go on. Their stop losses would have been down at that red line just underneath that horizontal green line. So we know if the market moved down to that red line, the retail traders would be losing. The retail traders' stop losses would be hit and we would have an opportunity to profit. What we have on the screen, that blue line on the screen, is part of the indicator which we have developed ourselves. Where the market hits that blue line, we call that absolute confirmation. We don't need any other confirmation. It gives us an unequivocal signal to enter. We take the trade. And what happens is as retail lose, we take more trades. It's very simple. We operate like that market maker. We target retail traders. The exact same again on this Euro Canadian dollar example. We know where the retail traders are selling. Over on that left hand side, back in November, the market kept going up and hitting a supposed ceiling. Those supposed ceilings are where retail traders, time and time again, try to make their money. They try to sell at the ceiling. We see a breakthrough. We know that it's hitting the stop losses of those retail traders. We know because the price is going up and it's hitting our proprietary trading signal. It gives us our unequivocal signal to enter. We capture profits. The same thing develops time and time again. Perhaps we can see it a little bit clearer by showing you a historical goal chart. We can see where retail are losing every single time. Where retail buy, where they believe a floor exists, they buy consistently, they fail, they panic, they flee, the market maker profits, 
we profit. We can see another floor appearing, more panic hitting the market. We can show you the exact same chart with our indicator in place, where you can see where the interaction with our blue line is. You can see where the retail is losing. And that's what we like to do. That's our unequivocal signal to enter into the market. Okay, so that's what we love to do. It's important to have that full strategy. It's important to know exactly where to enter. It's absolutely important to know where to exit. This is how we find our opportunities. Okay, this is exactly what we do, what we like. Consistently, we look for these types of opportunities. Okay, that's what we do. Where retail get it wrong, we capture these trades. So, the issue which we have is retail traders, they never behave appropriately. They never have a plan. They never have a plan to stick to. They don't know what they're doing. So, we've got to have a full structure for exactly what we're doing. And our next lesson is incredibly exciting because we're going to be focused on risk management. And risk management, that's another way of saying how you are going to go and protect your profits. So, do make sure to attend it. We have some exciting announcements, as we mentioned, which we're going to go through. But technical analysis, it is used by us to find our opponents. We anticipate where they're going to get it wrong and we're going to capitalize on it. At this stage, we have spoken to almost every student on this course over the past couple of weeks. And at one point, one point which has been raised time and time again is how can I work in this industry or how can I do better in this industry, whether it's for a firm or whether it's for myself. And you know what? That kind of makes sense because in a way, that's kind of why we're here, isn't it? And that's why most of you are here. Most of you are here to, in order to get a promotion or to, order to get a new job or maybe to do it for yourselves. And I can see a lot of students are typing in yes and exactly i can see paul i can see frank i can see Mohammed, i can see branca absolutely sean well done absolutely and the good news is that we're tr going to try to help you to answer that saying I don't like kids. I like kids. I have fun hanging out with my friends' kids and joking around with them, whatever. They're great. But I do feel like when I talk to my friends that recently had kids, it does seem like they had to give up everything for the kid. And that's very scary. You want to have a depressing conversation? Talk to a couple that just had a kid. Ask them about the last night they went out for themselves. They will describe the most boring, typical mundane evening out 